fund more expensive shifts rather than me trying to recruit doctors or get money for surgeries, why don't I go work on the root cause of so much of this sickness? Why don't I go work on water? So here's what I found. 663 million people today don't have clean water. That's actually gotten better over the years, as Angharad mentioned. But it's a huge, huge number. And this is what it looks like. It's not pretty. Kids like John Bosco in, in southern Rwanda, this was the only water he knew his entire life. Imagine giving this to your children, to your teenagers. It's a community in Ethiopia that was sharing just an open source with their, their cattle. Uh, this is a common sight for us to see kids and cows drinking from the same kind of puddles, little springs that are seeping through rock or through the dirt. This girl was in Honduras, she was drinking from her river. This is the stat uh, from the World Health Organization. 53% of disease throughout the developing world, 53%, more than half of the people that are sick are sick because of bad water and a lack of sanitation. So this is a really compelling thing to work on. I could play doctor to half of the sick people in the world simply by helping provide the most basic need. Some of these diseases you've all heard of, everyone's heard of cholera, E. coli. Maybe you have not heard of schistosoma, fancy word for <coughs> parasites or worms that uh, impacts over 100 million people every single day. This is what that looks like. This child was drinking uh, in Kenya from the Molo River and she would drink from this bottle and then she would throw up on her shirt and then she would pause and then she would try to drink a little more. She was very sick. We took the water away from her. I think we handed her some water and tried to, this is years ago, I don't even remember, uh, find a solution obviously for that village. But we brought this water back to New York and put it under a microscope and they made a video of her water. I remember the lab was unable to break down all of the different amoebas and parasites, but they said in their diagnosis that the water we sent them was alive. And obviously no child should be drinking water uh, that looks like this. We sent them some New York City tap water, we got absolutely nothing back. Schools without water. When I started, half of the world's schools didn't have clean water or toilets. So I was passionate about education, I'm sure like many people in this room, how good could your education be if there was no toilet at your school? if you had to go and get dirty water and bring it with you to school. And this is a huge problem for teenage girls, as you can imagine. Four or five days a month, they stay home from school because of course you're ashamed to go to a school with no water. And so many of them will spend the rest of the time that they should be in school walking for water. 40 pounds, 20 <coughs> liters on their back of water that's not even clean. Deeply impacts women. I have rarely ever seen men do anything when it comes to water. It is unfortunately, culturally, the, the role of women to go get the water. Oh, and to do the cooking, and to do the cleaning, and to go get the firewood. And we see women in the most deeply inhumane situations around the world. This woman was digging for water in a sandy riverbed, hoping that if she dug deep enough, she would find it. I asked her, you know, surely there was another option, because I didn't see a lot of other people here. But she said, the other option is terrible. It's a river and people get killed by crocodiles. Can't make this stuff up. So I go see the river. That's the river. And yeah, women were talking about crocodile attacks. And some of the survivors in this village would roll up their pant legs and show me these scars in their thighs and their calves <coughs> from where they had survived these attacks. The story that has moved me the most deeply in now almost 10 years of Charity Water. It's a story from Ethiopia. I've been there 27 times now. It's a country I love dearly. And I want to say five or six, seven times ago, I was in the north. I was staying in a terrible two pound a night hotel room. And I was in the kitchen of the hotel, if you could call it that, the little restaurant. And the hotel owner walks out and he recognized me and he knew the work that we had been doing there for years. And he said, let me tell you a story about water. Years ago in my village, there was this woman named Letakiris Hailu, and she used to walk eight hours every day for water. So she had a clay pot, she didn't have a yellow jerry can, she had this clay pot that was heavy, and she would walk a long distance and she would come back. It says one day, she comes back into the village, and before she reaches home, she slips and falls. And her clay pot breaks, and the water spills out into the dust. And he said she didn't go back home, she didn't go get more water. She hung herself from a tree in my village. 
And he let that sit for that little group for effect. And he said, the work you're doing is important. He walks back into the kitchen. I remember putting that in the category of not true, tell the Western donors a scary story. Couldn't be true. I sent our local partners out to her village. They confirmed that a woman named Ledekiros Hayalu had lived there and had died. And then recently, I just needed to reconnect, I think, on a more personal and visceral way to our work. And I got a pass from my wife to go live in this village for a week, completely off the grid, to see for myself. So I flew up to Tigray, to Mikele. I drove five hours to the end of the road. Then the road ended. I had to rent a donkey and a camel, put my solar backpack on it. And I had to hike nine hours to get to Ledekiros' village called Maya and pitch my tent next to the chief's house. I found 2,800 people living on this plateau years later and nothing had changed. I met Ledekiros' mom the next morning, who vividly recounted to me through a translator how she felt the moment they saw them carrying her daughter on a stretcher covered in a, a white shroud to her. She said she went ballistic. She started throwing herself around her stone house. She injured her back on the stone. She's never been the same. She said, things are very bad here. The girl that walked with Letakiros that day is still walking to the same source, so she'll take you there. So I go meet her best friend, Yeshereg. Yeshereg shows me the clay pots and the rope that they used to walk with. She says, these fortunately have been replaced now by these yellow jerry cans, which at least weigh less and are more resilient. But we're walking to the same place. So she takes me to the top of the plateau. Then we have to come down all the way down to the bottom of this ravine. I literally thought I was going to die. I've done some hiking before. I had never, I remember asking on the way down, I'm like, do people ever fall off? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> you get to the bottom, long line of jerry cans because there's not enough water. It's a point in the dry season. So if it's not bad enough, once you get down there, you have to wait a few hours. It takes 30 minutes to fill up one of these jerry cans from this little bit of seepage. Your other option is a river that's about five miles away. They take me up and show me the church where she was uh, given her funeral. They said over 2,000 people came to her funeral, took me to her grave. It's a little pile of rocks behind the church. And then they took me to the tree where they found her body. She was 13 at the time of her death. And I asked her friend, I said, why do you think she didn't just go back for more water? Why not go the next day? Her friend said she was a different, she was different than the rest of us. She always had this hope of making life better here. She would talk about healthcare. She would talk about education. She would talk about bringing a road and bringing schools and bringing water. And she had such a sense of responsibility, her friend said, she would have been overcome with shame that she'd let her family down because they needed that water for dinner. And she couldn't face her mom because her carelessness is going to cause the family to go without water that night. I'm sure if every one of you spent five days in this village, it would change your outlook <laughs> on a lot of things. And it deeply, deeply moved me as a great reminder of why we need to do something about this. Who we're fighting for, 13-year-old girls, that just because of where they're born,